In today's video, we are going over an evidence-based guide to lateral ankle sprains. Let's go. I've also created an evidence-based guide to ankle sprain injuries cheat sheet. It's a handout that goes along with today's lesson. We go over all the basic points I just went over, prevalence, history, prognosis, predisposing factors, mechanisms of injury, anatomy, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, treatments, return to sport and work, and injury prevention. I'll leave a link in the show notes, 100% free. You can go ahead and download that. Again, it's a companion for what we're going to go over today. It's also a really nice uh, reference sheet that you can go back on a little bit later in the future. If you kind of forget what I went over, you want a quick refresher, it's all going to be there. So what's the problem with lateral ankle sprains? So lateral ankle sprains are very, very common. It, depending on the study that you look at, it is the number one injury in sports. Okay. Again, that's going to vary based on the population. Uh, it's very scary when it occurs. It's one of the major reasons why folks go to the emergency room. Symptoms typically resolve pretty quickly after you have a lateral ankle sprain. And largely that's a good thing. But the problem is that up to 50% of folks after they have a first lateral ankle sprain will have recurrences. So they tend to occur again in the future or they're left with some sort of long-standing instability, pain, swelling. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but something known as chronic ankle instability, which is another big problem. Largely, it's not taken very seriously as an injury, despite a lot of folks going to the emergency room. A big chunk of folks that do end up with a lateral ankle sprain, uh, they don't end up seeking medical attention. Another huge problem with lateral ankle sprains is misinformation. So let's say you sprain your ankle and you go to Dr. Google, and you type in lateral ankle sprain or lateral ankle sprain treatment. You'll have a bunch of information pop up. These were the first three articles that popped up when I Googled lateral ankle sprain treatments. <clears throat> and largely it looks like they're reputable sources. So one is from the Mayo Clinic. One is from UConn. So major university there. Uh, the third is just rehabaccess.com. No idea what that source is. Uh, but largely, they give information out about using rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. And they also largely talk about not ambulating for up to two weeks after you have a lateral ankle sprain. That information is just wrong. Okay. So we'll talk about what the evidence says a little bit later about rice and also about ambulating or walking after you have a lateral ankle sprain. But suffice to say, this information is just wrong. And the sources look reputable. They look pretty good, right? And it's the first few sources that pop up after you go on Google. Now, this is a huge problem because we'll see in a bit having an ankle sprain is a serious issue and it's a big burden on our society from a healthcare cost expense. And largely, if you go on Google and try to find the answer, right, be informed consumer information after you have an injury, you're not going to get good information. It's bad. So um, that's a big problem. So in today's episode, we have an evidence-based guide to lateral ankle sprains. We're going to be going over the prevalence of these injuries. We're going to go over history and a clinical presentation of lateral ankle sprains. We're going to go over prognosis and natural history. So how long do these things tend to get better? What happens to them over the course of time? What are predisposing factors to the injury? What are your risk factors? What is the mechanism of injury? What is the anatomy of a lateral ankle sprain? <clears throat> What is the diagnosis as well as differential diagnosis? What else might be going on at the ankle if you roll it or twist it? What are the best treatments for lateral ankle sprains? How do we return to work or return to sport? And lastly, how do we prevent future injuries? So the majority of information we're going over today is from one article. It's from the British Journal of Sports Medicine. I'll leave a link in the show notes so you guys can definitely check that out if you're interested. It's called Diagnosis, Treatment, and Prevention of Ankle Sprains, Update of an Evidence-Based Clinical Guideline. So this was a great paper. Uh, it's a little bit older. It's 2018, right? But when I was doing my deep dive, my literature review, and trying to figure out the best papers to include in this presentation today, this was by far the best. So if there's some more information after 2018, I actually included that, and I put all of my references in the show notes, but largely the majority of the information today is actually coming from this article. So what's all this hubbub about lateral ankle sprains? Well, it's the most common lower extremity injury, especially in physically active individuals. There are around 2 million sprains treated in the emergency room annually in the U.S. and U.K. combined. In sport, it constitutes somewhere between 16 and 40 percent of all injuries, right? That's a wild number. The reason why there's so much variety is because it really depends on the sport mostly. In the U.S., lateral ankle sprains have the highest recurrence rate of any injury. Now, this is amazing because we know that if you had a prior injury, it's going to predispose you to a future injury, oftentimes in the same area. 
Uh, that's certainly true for lateral ankle sprains and has the highest recurrence rate of any injury. Okay. And that's a big problem. And we'll talk about why this is an issue that's important, largely spoiler alert, because we can actually help folks. Okay. And reduce that recurrence rate. So up to 40% of people, excuse me, 47% of people with a lateral ankle sprain go on to have chronic pain or recurrences. Okay. Um, and that's a big problem because largely lateral ankle sprains are not treated like a serious problem, although they end up being a serious problem for most folks. This next quote is from Wageman's et al. in 2022. Many of the practitioners treating these injuries, lateral ankle sprains, have a moderate understanding of their epidemiology and often limit management to rest, ice, compression, elevation. Now, we just said that's what Google says. So obviously, this is misinformation. Furthermore, the public perception that ankle sprains are innocuous remains widespread. It is estimated that less than 50% of individuals who incur an ankle sprain consult a medical professional, right? Now, one of the reasons why this is a big problem is because rehab, good physical therapy rehab, reduces the risk of recurrent ankle sprains by 40% compared to usual care or doing nothing. So the information that's available right now on Google is just straight wrong. And it also appears that medical providers don't know this. And this is a big problem. Hence the reason why we're going over this guide today. Here's another big issue. Despite being the most commonly incurred sports injury with a high recurrence rate, we just said around 50%, there are no guidelines to inform return to sport decisions following acute lateral ankle sprains. So what that means is folks get an ankle sprain injury and they return back to their sport. And there's no testing to see if you're ready to go back to sport. Okay. And we actually do have a, a decent bit of guidance. We'll talk about a little bit later, uh, but largely most folks are not going through this process before the return to sport. So more than half of individuals who sustain a lateral ankle sprain injury do not seek formal medical treatment. And many return to sport before injury associated impairments are, are results. In fact, 71 to 75% of U.S. high school athletes were sanctioned to return to sport within three days of incurring an or excuse me, acute lateral ankle sprain, with 95% sanctioned to return to sport within 10 days of injury. This stat is wild to me, right? So essentially, half of all folks that get a lateral ankle sprain that are athletes return to sport within one day. The large majority get back within 10 days. Okay. We also know that those recurrence rates are quite high. Uh, I'll tell you, I've had a bunch of lateral ankle sprains in my youth, right? I can't tell you how many times I kind of twisted or rolled my ankle and just got right back to activity and didn't think about it. Didn't even tell my coach, just kind of went back to training, right? And I think that's largely what happens for most folks. They don't take it seriously. And since symptoms resolve relatively quickly, we're like, all right, we're good. No problem. Let's just keep moving on. It's just that the recurrence rates are, are quite high. Uh, and the other problem with that is that nobody wants chronic pain or recurrences, but also can increase the rate of osteoarthritis over the course of time. That's not good either. Okay. So when exposing athletes with recurrent sprains to proprioceptive training, the risk of recurrence of a lateral ankle sprain is reduced to the same level as healthy controls. Now this stat is wild to me, right? So largely you have all these folks getting lateral ankle sprains. Okay, 50% of them, literally half of those folks are ending up with chronic pain. And if you expose those folks to a really good physical therapy program with proprioceptive training, their risk of lateral ankle sprains goes right down to the level of that, what it was before you had an injury. And that's absolutely remarkable. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's going to be a little bit of what we talk about today, but largely we should probably be telling these folks to do some sort of rehab program, not rushing them back to sport so quickly. Lateral ankle sprains also have a large societal burden. What do I mean by that? So largely, it costs the healthcare system money every time someone sprains their ankle, right? Estimated societal costs per injury, at least in the UK, are somewhere between 360 to 1,100 euros per injury. So 2 million patients annually are hurt with a lateral ankle sprain in the UK, the United States, if you do some math, 1,000 euros times, let's say, 1 million patients, that's a lot of money for the gov government to hand out to try to handle these lateral ankle sprains. The other piece is they lead to a lot of lost work time. Let's say you sprain your ankle. You go on Google. Google tells you not to walk for two weeks. You're not going to work. Okay, You're going to sit on your butt all day long, get more sedentary, right? lose time from work, be more expensive. The other piece we know is that people lose sport time. And this is a problem because we want people to be healthy. 
It also causes folks to be sedentary. Let's say you take an active person who's less cost to the government, make them sedentary because they had an ankle sprain injury, and all of a sudden they become less healthy, and it causes long-term problems. So what's the prevalence of lateral ankle sprains? Well, it's high. 40% of all lateral ankle sprains are from athletics. So largely it's a sports injury, although there's a lot of folks that get their ankle rolled and it's not from a sport, right? And the average amount of lateral ankle sprains is seven per every 1,000 hours of participation. And this is coming from indoor sports where the large majority of lateral ankle sprains occur, right? So if you're playing a sport that's not indoor, and it doesn't have a high risk of lateral ankle sprains, your number is not going to be quite as high. But in these indoor sports, it is actually quite high. And like I said previously, only 50% of these folks are going to seek medical attention, and then up to 50% end up with recurrences or chronic ankle instability. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. So I made a mini course that's absolutely free. That's the next logical step if you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective, but doesn't really teach you how to work with high-level athletes in the fitness world, right? Doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. Doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym. Doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over, Seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to get your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. It's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym, but if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay. So I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain-free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. So what is chronic ankle instability? It is persistent pain, swelling, and or giving way. So some sort of instability and or recurrent sprains for at least one year after initial injury. It's going to lead to long-term absenteeance from work and sports and has a large socioeconomic burden. Okay, it's expensive. Folks that roll their ankles have a good chance of having chronic ankle instability and become expensive folks for that reason. It's also associated with osteochondral lesions and joint degeneration. So if you end up with an ankle sprain, 50-50 shot of getting chronic ankle instability, and you may end up with more osteoarthritis and disability over the course of time for that reason. This is why an accurate diagnosis, treatment, and prevention could reduce some of this socioeconomic burden and keep people fit, active, and healthy. We should probably take these injuries a little bit more seriously than we currently do. What is the prognosis or natural history of lateral ankle sprains? So largely, these get better very quickly. So within the first two weeks, pain rapidly resolves in the large majority of individuals. And these stats are kind of crazy to me. The average time to return to sport after lateral ankle sprain is 16 to 24 days. If you look at NCAA athletes, in 44% of the lateral ankle sprains, athlete returned to play in less than 24 hours. So half of folks are getting back to sport right away, within 24 hours. In 3.6%, the athlete required more than 21 days before returning to play. So around 96% of folks are getting back before three weeks, okay? And that's a good thing. So largely folks get back relatively quickly and it doesn't take too long. A few people take three weeks or more, but not that many. I know I'm harping on this like crazy, but up to 40% of these injuries become chronic ankle instability or recurrent sprains. And here are some kind of interesting stats I picked up. So at three months follow-up, let's say you have a lateral ankle sprain and they're looking at your ankle three months after the injury, 65% of participants reported instability. 24% reported one or more re-sprains, excuse me, re-sprains. At 12-month follow-up, 55% still reported that same instability, and greater than 50% regarded themselves as not completely recovered. At the one- to four-year follow-up, 5 to 46% of patients still experience some sort of pain. 3 to 34% of patients experience recurrent sprains. So they had another ankle sprain. And 33 to 55% of patients reported instability. 
at the 2.5 to 5-year follow-up, clinical symptoms of anterior ankle impingement were present in 25% of all athletes. So what does that mean? So largely when these athletes try to dorsiflex their ankle, they'll have some sort of painful pinching or restricted range of motion in the front of the ankle. Can't tell you how many athletes I've worked with that strain their, excuse me, sprain their ankle at some point in the past. And now they feel kind of blocked in the front of the ankle, kind of painful pinchy sensation in the front portion of their ankle. Okay. There was radiologically confirmed tibio Taylor osteophyte bone formation, 82% of these athletes. So after you have a lateral ankle sprain over the course of time, this leads to a sequelae of events where your body starts to form some bone in the front portion of the ankle. And this leads to those symptoms of anterior ankle impingement. Okay. Now it makes sense if we can reduce some of this by doing a really good rehab program, we should, but our research isn't robust enough to tell us if we do rehab after someone has ankle sprain, if we'll actually reduce some of these issues in the future. So what are some predisposing risk factors for lateral ankle sprain? If you look at the intrinsic risk factors, being a female increases your risk of lateral ankle sprain. Having limited ankle dorsiflexion range of motion does as well. Reduced proprioception. So if you score poorly on a star excursion balance test or other form of balance tests, that may uh, predispose you to more lateral ankle sprains. If you have deficiencies in postural balance and control, so same thing. If you have trouble with single-legged balance, that could be a problem. Things that may affect your wrist are high medial plantar pressures during running. If you have either high or low BMI, this may increase your risk. And some additional factors that may contribute to increased risk are reduced strength, reduced coordination, poor cardiorespiratory endurance, limited overall ankle joint range of motion, decreased peroneal reaction time. So we have some interesting research to show that if you roll your ankle, that could potentially cause some nerve injury, which will now delay firing of the peroneals. And when you try to land well in the future as an athlete, you may not be able to fire the, excuse me, fire the peroneals quickly. And that might increase your risk of having future ankle sprain injuries. Some intrinsic risk factors are the sport that you play. So if you play aero ball, and I had no idea what this sport was previously, but largely it's a trampoline sport. So obviously it's a lot of jumping and landing. If you play basketball, indoor volleyball, field sports, or climbing, your risk of lateral ankle sprains is higher. You also will have a higher risk with soccer. And if you play on grass, you're more likely to have an ankle sprain than playing on turf. So I played soccer in high school and I often played on really poor fields. And if it was a bad field, if you step in a hole, you might roll your ankle. So that makes sense. So position is probably going to be a player and whether or not you get an ankle sprain injury with defenders and soccers having more injuries and other position players. So what are the prognostic risk factors for developing chronic ankle instability? We just went over the risk factors for having a lateral ankle sprain injury. Can we identify the folks who are going to go on to have chronic ankle instability? And here are some prognostic factors that were identified in these studies. An inability to complete jumping and landing within two weeks after a first time LAS, which makes sense. If you have a worse injury, maybe that increases your risk of chronic ankle instability. If you have deficiencies in dynamic postural control, increase your risk. Altered hip joint kinematics. So if you're jumping and landing and having poor control at those joints, could be a problem. Having a lack of mechanically stability slash increased ligament laxity eight weeks after an ankle sprain. So having an anterior drawer that's more positive after an injury, eight weeks after the injury, increase your risk. Sports participate, excuse me, participation at a high level. So if you're an elite athlete, that may expose you to more risk of injury compared to a recreational athlete. Being a young male increases your risk. Having increased BMI increases your risk. Having greater body height, so there's bigger, taller people are more likely to get CAI. Persistent postural imbalances, which is largely balance over the course of time. And also having high workloads after initial injury. So let's say you get injured in the middle of a season and you have a whole bunch of games coming up more than usual. That may actually increase your risk of developing chronic ankle instability, probably because you're not allowing time for this to heal and doing a solid rehab program. You're just playing your sport at a high level like you normally would, right? So let's talk a little anatomy of lateral ankle sprains. So lateral ankle sprains make up 85% of 
all ankle sprains. So there are other types of ankle sprains. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but you can have high ankle sprains. You can also have medial sided ankle sprains. The large majority are going to be lateral ankle sprains. And 65% of all ankle sprains, these are going to be isolated injury to the ATFL ligament. In 15% of all cases, you're going to have a combined injury of the ATFL and the CFL. It's actually pretty uncommon to hurt the CFL by itself, although that certainly can happen. The remaining 15% of all cases of ankle sprains are either going to be a high ankle sprain or a medial or deltoid ligament ankle sprain. If you have a high ankle sprain, that's an injury to the tibiofibular ligaments. And these ligaments are going to connect your tibia with your fibula. And when folks have this type of sprain injury, the pain is felt a little bit higher compared to a lateral ankle sprain where the pain is felt more on the side. Okay. In folks that have a medial ankle sprain or kind of an eversion injury, as opposed to an inversion injury for lateral ankle sprains, you may have an injury to the deltoid ligament. One of the reasons why the ATFL might be injured more than other ligaments of the ankle is because it's the weakest ligament and it makes up 70% of all lateral ankle sprain injuries. The mechanism of injury, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in a minute, is usually some sort of inversion ankle injury. So you invert your ankle while plantar flex and it ends up stretching out or tearing the ATFL. The CFL, or their calcaneal fibular ligament injury, a little less common, this is often injured with an inversion as well, but oftentimes it's dorsiflexion with inversion. If you plantar flex and invert, it's going to potentially tear the ATFL more frequently. If you dorsiflex invert, potentially you end up putting more stress on the CFL and tearing that. In terms of the posterior talofibular ligament, this is the least common injury of all three lateral ligaments. So what's the mechanism of injury of a lateral ankle sprain? It's largely rolling on the ankle. So if you land on the outside of your foot, let's say that you're cutting in athletics, right? And you land accidentally outside of the foot, or you step off a curb and you land on the outside of your foot and the foot inverts. Okay. So basically you're landing on the side of your foot. You can sprain the ankle. And like I said previously, if you land in more plantar flexion, probably going to be an ATFL injury. And if you land in more dorsiflexion, maybe you add in that CFL injury. So again, the common mechanism of injury are landing from a jump funny, attempting to cut or change direction, laying on the side of the foot, or maybe stepping off a curb and landing on the side of the foot. So we have my ankle here, okay, right here. And you can see this is the side of my lower legs. This would be the fibula, right? Here's the calcaneus or the heel. Right next to it is going to be the talus, okay? So the most common ligament to be injured is going to be the ATFL. So anterior talofibular ligament, which attaches right here, okay? So largely, if you have someone who has an ATFL injury, this is where it's going to hurt. You can palpate the fibular uh, lateral malleolus and kind of come down anteriorly and inferiorly right next to the talus and palpate there. That's going to be where symptoms are felt in those folks. And someone that has a CFL injury, so we have the fibula right here, and we have the calcaneus right here, right between the two here would be a CFL injury. And lastly, and this is the least common, is going to be a PTFL, posterior talofibular ligament. So fibula right here, talus right here. This is where that ligament is, right in that area here. A little less common injury, but it's something I'm actually dealing with right now, is a high ankle sprain. So if you look at your tibia right here, and your fibula right next to it, the syndesmotic ligament, so the ligaments that connect the fibula with the tibia are going to lie right in this area and kind of go up between the two bones. And when folks have an injury here, they typically feel pain higher right between these two bones here, okay? So the mechanism of injury is going to be a little bit different for every type of injury like we said before. So in my classic inversion sprain injury that most folks get, you land in plantar flexion and inversion, okay? And because of that, we stretch the ATFL. In folks that have a CFL injury, that's often dorsiflexion, so here, with inversion, dorsiflexion, inversion. Lastly, with high ankle sprains, this is usually going to be a rotation, so dorsiflexion, external rotation injury, which, again, is going to stretch out this uh, place between the fibula and the tibia causing injuries here. Another important concept to think about is that when you sprain your ankle and roll your ankle, we'll stretch the outside 
of the ankle. And usually we think about the ATFL being injured, the CFL being injured, maybe the perennials get a little bit injured. However, you also compress the inside. So when I sprain my ankle, I stretch everything on the outside. I actually compress everything on the inside of the joint. And because of that, you may find folks with bone or cartilage related injuries. Bone bruises are actually relatively common with lateral ankle sprains. And bone can be pretty dang painful. So when you're rehabbing these folks, oftentimes they'll complain of having some sort of medial sided pain that lasts a lot longer than the lateral side of pain. And that may be a little bit confusing, but that could be one of the reasons why. Okay. The other piece to think about is when you have an inversion sprain injury, you could also end up injuring the peroneal nerves. So if I'm going to end range plantar flexion inversion, I may stretch everything on the outside in front of my ankle. And what can happen there is that you have an injury to the nerves. And I had said this previously, but you might end up with delayed reaction time, of the peroneals, which could predispose you to more recurrent ankle instability problems because you can't fire those muscles quickly when you land and you might have recurrent injuries as a result. The other piece I think is relevant is that when folks have a lateral ankle sprain, they end up having a lot of swelling. Again, we'll talk about this a little bit later. They have a lot of swelling. So they have swelling in the front and the back and the side into the toes. They're swelling everywhere. So largely the joint is sitting in this inflammatory soup. So they're probably going to have more pain on the lateral side of the ankle, maybe immediately because of a bone bruise or some sort of cartilage injury. But at the end of the day, everything within the ankle is sitting in this inflammatory soup. So they could really have pain all over the place. Okay. So just keep in mind when you're rehabbing these folks, they may tell you they have pain on the front, the side, and inside, on the outside, all over the place. And this is probably just because there's so much swelling irritation. So what is the diagnosis and clinical presentation of lateral ankle sprains? So these folks present with a history of rolling an ankle. Oftentimes it's going to be recurrence, right? We said this before, a large percent of folks will re-injure after they have the initial injury. So oftentimes you have someone come in and said, I rolled my ankle. I've done it in the past. Okay. Usually this is going to be an acute injury. Like I said, people roll the ankle. So if someone had a slow onset of symptoms over the course of time, I'm thinking less of a lateral ankle sprain and maybe something else that's going on. These folks often present with a lot of swelling and bruising, a hematoma, and they may have swelling on the outside of the foot, but it could extend into the toes. And this is probably just because of gravity. So if you have an ankle sprain, it may start with bruising, hematoma, a little bit higher up the ankle, and then it just kind of extends down just due to gravity, right? These folks will often have some difficulty ambulating, especially with those higher grade injuries. So grade two, grade three, just keep in mind, if they can't walk for more than four steps at the time of the injury, uh, you may want to send them in for some uh, imaging because they may have a fracture. What are some good diagnostic tests for ATFL injuries? So a good test to determine if your athlete has a rupture is that if they have a hematoma present, if they have pain on palpation around the distal fibula where the ATFL attaches and or a positive anterior drawer test, there's a good chance they have a rupture of the ATFL. The anterior drawer test by itself has a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 96% if the clinical assessment is delayed for between four and five days after an injury. If you've seen one of these lateral ankle sprains immediately after, I think immediately after is usually not as painful. And then over the next few hours or that evening or the next morning, usually it's very, very painful, and very irritated. So if you're doing these clinical tests too early with folks, it might be too irritated or maybe not irritated enough yet to actually get a positive test. So if you wait four to five days after the injury, they're actually a little bit better. So this test is actually quite specific at 96%. So if you have a positive test, there's a good chance you do end up having a lateral ankle sprain. It's fairly sensitive at 84%. So if you have a negative test, we could probably rule out lateral ankle sprain, although it's not 100% sensitivity. What are some diagnostic tests for the CFL? Well, we don't have the best test for the CFL, okay? Largely, you can palpate the area. So if there's tenderness to palpation for the CFL, it may help to rule in a CFL injury. We can also use the Taylor Tilt Test, which has a sensitivity of 67% and a specificity of 75% for a complete double ligament rupture. So largely, the Taylor Tilt Test is helpful for rolling in or rolling out a tear of both the ATFL and the CFL, but we cannot accurately diagnose isolated CFL lesions well. 
So if we want to try to get that true answer, we probably have to send him for some imaging, maybe an MRI or ultrasound of sorts. May not have to do that. We'll talk about diagnosis via imaging a little bit later and whether or not we have to go down that pathway. How about grading ankle sprain injuries? So you can have a really bad ankle sprain injury. You're going to have an ankle sprain that wasn't that bad, right? So there's grades. They're between one and three, one being the easiest or best type of sprain, not that much damage. And then grade three is the worst type of sprain injury. Uh, what's important to keep in mind is that all these grades are subjective. Okay. So it's actually really challenging to determine exactly what grade uh, an injury someone has. So just take these grades with a grain of salt. They're not perfect, but they can help determine the severity of the injury. Grade one ankle sprains are considered mild. Usually there's some mild swelling, some mild tenderness, and minimal difficulty in range of motion. Grade two injuries are a moderate sprain, usually have a little bit of micro ligament lesions associated with this. Grade three are the most severe sprain injuries, and usually there is a full ligament lesion, okay? So fully torn, the ATFL or CFL, and usually there's diffuse swelling, so swelling all over the place, echomosis or bruising, a lot of tenderness, positive provocative tests, and oftentimes inability to weight bear. So what is important from a differential diagnosis for lateral ankle sprains? Well, first and foremost, it's important that you rule out fractures of the ankle. So this stat is in individuals that ended up undergoing uh, imaging for their lateral ankle, which means they probably had a pretty bad sprain injury. But at least in these folks that underwent imaging, so an x-ray for a lateral sprain injury, 15% of those folks actually had a fracture, okay? So it's important when you have a patient that comes in with a lateral ankle sprain that you try your best to rule out a fracture before starting physical therapy. And if you do have a positive test, we're going to talk about the auto ankle rules, then you send in for some additional imaging. So a really good test to figure out if someone has dealing with a fracture is going to be the Ottawa ankle rules. And largely, if your patient has bony tenderness along the distal six centimeters of posterior edge of their fibula or tip of the lateral malleolus, if they have bony tenderness along the distal six centimeters of posterior edge or tibia of the medial malleolus, if they have bony tenderness at the base of the fifth met head, if they have bony tenderness at the navicular, or that they have inability to bear weight both immediately after injury or for four steps during your initial evaluation, then you probably need to send them in for some imaging. The Ottawa ankle rules are very sensitive. And what that means is that if you have a patient that comes in and all of these tests are negative, there's a really good chance they don't have an ankle fracture. The specificity is not quite as good. So if you have a patient, you palpate, let's say their navicular head, and you find that it is tender, you want to send in for imaging to rule out fracture at this point. Just because it's tender doesn't necessarily mean it is broken. But if you have a broken ankle, the treatment is going to be different than if it's not broken, right? So definitely do the auto ankle rules on your patients before you start exercise. It's important we rule out fracture because we don't want to be exercising on broken bones. We also want to be on the lookout for different types of ankle sprain injuries, just because these are treated a little bit differently, and maybe they take a little bit more or less time to get better. So one of which is going to be a high ankle sprain. So that's a syndesmotic ligament injury that we just talked about. Typically, these occur with a twisting injury. So sort of dorsiflexion, external rotation of the lower leg can end up uh, spraining those syndesmotic ligaments. Okay. So from a mechanism of injury perspective, folks may say that they twisted their ankle as opposed to rolling it with a lateral ankle sprain. Usually this pain is much higher, hence the name high ankle sprain. So largely these folks will feel pain between the tibia and fibula. It may extend upwards from there. Okay. You can also palpate those syndesmotic ligaments to see if they're irritated and that may help to rule in the high ankle sprain. You can also try a dorsiflexion external rotation test, which is exactly what it sounds like. Dorsiflex the ankle, externally rotate, if that's going to reproduce the patient's familiar symptoms, especially in those syndesmotic ligament location, rules in hopefully the high ankle sprain. You can also try a squeeze test. So you take your hands halfway up the patient's calf, squeeze on the tibia and fibula together, and that will gap the distal tibia and fibula and stretch the syndesmotic ligaments. If that creates pain in your patient, that would be a positive test. It might help to rule in a high ankle sprain. The thing about high ankle sprains, and obviously that's a lesson for another day, is that these tend to take a little bit longer to heal. 
And the other point is that they tend not to handle rotation well. So early on, after you have a high ankle sprain injury, you probably don't want to do a lot of rotation. But later on in rehab, we certainly need to be able to restore that. So your rehab is going to look a little different from a lateral ankle sprain, which tends not to be able to handle stress in the frontal plane initially. And then later on rehab, we have to make sure we really hammer frontal plane stability to return back to safe, uh, excuse me, return back to sport and activity safely. We also want to be on the lookout for medial ankle sprains. This would be a deltoid ligament injury. So basically pain on the inside of the ankle where palpating the deltoid ligament hurts may rule in a medial ankle sprain injury. Usually this is an eversion mechanism of injury. So the opposite of the lateral ankle sprain, which is typically inversion, it's much less common. Again, the pain is medial sided. Uh, do keep in mind in folks that have a lateral ankle sprain that roll their ankle, they could have medial sided pain. That could be because of the swelling or they have some sort of bone or cartilage injury as a result of the lateral ankle sprain. So just make sure you're thinking about that when you're evaluating your patient. And usually they'll have pain with eversion of the ankle. Eversion kind of hurt. Uh, although keep in mind, I currently have a high ankle sprain. I've had some lateral ankle sprain patients in the past. And if you evert my ankle, it hurts me, right? But it hurts in the syndesmotic ligaments. It doesn't hurt on the medial side, but the deltoid ligament. So again, make sure that you take all of these together with a grain of salt and use your brain to come up with a good diagnosis. So what are the best treatments for lateral ankle sprains? Because we have a lot of them. And we're going to go over all the evidence to tell you what the best treatments actually are. We're going to go over the classic RICE, rest, ice, compression, elevation. We'll go over intermittent compression, something like using a Normatec. We'll go over compression garments, like a compression stock, stocking or sock. We'll go over NSAIDs like ibuprofen, different injections like PRP or hyaluronic acid. We'll go over immobilization. Should you cast these things and not put any weight on it for four to six weeks? We'll go over functional supports or braces like an ASO. We'll go over exercise like proprioception, proprioception training, balance training. We'll go over manual therapies. Do manual therapies work? How about surgery? And in which patients should you maybe start thinking about surgery? And lastly, ultrasound, laser, or electrotherapy. Uh, is there any efficacy of these treatments? So let's go over everyone's favorite treatment for lateral ankle sprains, rice, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. This is what Google tells me to do. If I sprain my ankle, it's what the Mayo Clinic says to do. It's what UConn says to do. It's what largely Google says. Uh, if you, if you start looking around and how to treat lateral ankle sprains. So Basically, there's little to no scientific support in reducing injury-related symptoms by using the RICE formula. So largely, ricing doesn't improve function, it doesn't decrease swelling, and it doesn't decrease pain. If you combine ice with exercise, that improves exercise tolerance and function and helps reduce swelling over exercise and heat. So if you sprain your ankle and you heat it in exercise, it doesn't go as well as if you sprain your ankle and then exercise and use ice, okay? And the recommendation from this BGSM article is that there is no evidence that rice alone or cryotherapy or compression therapy alone has any positive influence on pain, swelling, or patient function. Therefore, there is no role for rice alone in the treatment of acute lateral ankle sprain injuries. So largely, the information that you get from google.com is inaccurate. Okay, it's not a good way to treat these lateral ankle sprain injuries. Stop ricing your patients. How about intermittent compression for lateral ankle sprains? So what actually is intermittent compression? So if you've ever seen a Normatec device, largely you have a pair of pants that goes over top of your legs, and then it fills up and compresses the legs, and then it relaxes, and it fills up and compresses the legs, and it relaxes. So intermittent compression. Does this have any efficacy for lateral ankle sprains? And largely, evidence is inconclusive. So maybe, maybe not. There's mixed research out there. I'd say if your patients love it and they really feel like it's helping, then maybe go for it. But it's not going to be the gold standard treatment. I definitely wouldn't make this the majority of what I do for my lateral ankle sprain patients. Are compression garments helpful for lateral ankle sprains? So basically, compression socks, those really, really tight socks you see patients wear after they have a major surgery. Maybe you have some patients that have diabetes and they have a hard time healing wounds in their lower leg. Um, sometimes they wear these. Are they helpful for lateral ankle sprain injuries? Can they help reduce swelling? 
So wearing compression stockings beyond the acute phase is not helpful in the treatment of acute lateral ankle ligament injuries in the general population. However, a beneficial effect was observed only in a subgroup of patients as compression stockings significantly decrease the time to return to sport activity. So a compression garment worn after a lateral ankle sprain might not help the average person return back to walking faster or longer term outcomes. However, it seems like it may be helpful for athletes. So if you have an individual that has a lot of swelling after a lateral ankle sprain, they're trying to get back to a sport might be worthwhile to give them a compression sleeve or some sort of compression sock to help them out. Are NSAIDs effective for treating lateral ankle sprain injuries? And by NSAID, I mean non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, something like an ibuprofen. However, they were looking at a variety of different NSAIDs and seeing if they help folks that have this injury. They're also either oral or topical. So some of the NSAIDs were actually applied on the skin. Some were taken in pill form, right? And largely, NSAIDs result in less pain in the short term after lateral ankle sprain injuries, and that's defined as less than 14 days. So in the short term, they seem to be quite helpful for reducing pain. Long term doesn't seem to have that same effect. The other thing they found is that there was not a significant increase in the risk of adverse events compared with placebo. Uh, do keep in mind these studies were in young, healthy individuals and older folks. It might not be the case, especially in people that aren't healthy, right? One concern of using NSAIDs is that it may delay the natural healing process. This is because inflammation is suppressed by NSAIDs, and this inflammation is going to be a necessary component of tissue recovery. So our recommendations from the BGSM article were NSAIDs may be used by patients who have incurred an acute lateral ankle sprain for the primary purpose of reducing pain and swelling. However, care should be taken in NSAID usage as it is associated with complications, potentially, and may suppress or delay the natural healing process, okay? So you kind of want to have some inflammation after you have a lateral ankle sprain. If we take away that inflammation, does that lead to longer-term issues? We're not sure, but that is a concern that probably needs to be studied a bit more in the future. How about different injection therapies for lateral ankle sprain? Is that effective as a treatment? So when looking at PRP or platelet-rich plasma injections, there was not a superior effect for pain and function compared to placebo. When looking at injections of hyaluronic acid into the joint, it was helpful for pain in the short term. However, there's no change in return to sport or recurrence. So hyaluronic acid injections might be helpful for pain, but not necessarily long-term outcome. Are functional support braces effective as a treatment for lateral ankle sprain? So ankle support was more effective compared with treatment with a less adequate support, such as compression bandage or tuber grip. What does that mean? So if you use something like an ASO, an ankle stabilized orthosis, maybe a lace up brace, if you compare that using something like a tube grip or compression bandage, the functional brace or the ASO performs better as a treatment. Functional support bracing also has a better outcome compared to sports tape that's non elastic or an elastic tape like a kinesio tape. So something like an ASO typically works a little bit better than just taping the ankle, although they do work well together. From the same study where they were looking at tape versus an ASO, the authors concluded that kinesio tape is unlikely to provide sufficient mechanical support in unstable ankles. So tape or an ASO is going to be more supportive than kinesio tape, which probably isn't supportive at all. So the BDSM recommendation for functional support braces was the use of a support for four to six weeks is preferred over immobilization. The use of an ankle brace shows the greatest effects compared with other types of functional support like tape. So should we immobilize these folks? So basically, should we put them inside of a cast? Don't let them move for weeks at a time. So if you have a minimum of four weeks in a lower leg cast, this is going to result in less optimal outcomes compared with a functional support and exercise strategy. Okay. So cast is not a good idea compared to just putting someone into a lace up brace and then giving them exercise. However, in the short term, so less than 10 days, immobilization with a plaster cast or rigid support decreases pain and edema and improves functional outcome. So in folks that have a high grade ankle sprain, it might be worthwhile to consider mobilization, but for a very short period of time, less than 10 days. Okay. So the BDSM recommendation for mobilization is that the use of a functional support brace, like an ASO, an exercise therapy is preferred 
as it provides better outcomes compared with immobilization. If immobilization is applied to treat pain or edema, it should be for a maximum of 10 days after which a functional treatment should be commenced. So largely, if you have someone who has a really bad ankle sprain, it may be worthwhile to mobilize for a short period of time. However, we need to get them moving as quickly as we can. Is exercise effective as a treatment for lateral ankle sprains? Well, yes, it is. However, a lot of folks with a lateral ankle sprain go right back to sport almost immediately, and we know that doesn't work well either. So it's not just exercise being good. It probably has to do with the dosage of exercise and the exercise you actually choose, right? Uh, what do these exercise programs generally consist of? Normally, they have neuromuscular and proprioceptive exercises, and I think that's a fancy way of saying there's a lot of balance exercises included, right? So exercise therapy programs, when initiated early, reduce the prevalence of recurrent injuries and functional ankle instability. They also lead to a quicker time to recovery, a quicker time to return to sport. They also lead to enhanced outcomes. So all signs point to good when it comes to exercise. How about supervised physical therapy? Do you need to go to a physical therapy clinic to get an exercise program and have someone watch you do the exercise as opposed to just getting a home exercise program, going home and just doing the exercise on your own? So our literature shows there may be some benefit compared to a home exercise program. It may lead to improvements in ankle strength, proprioception, faster return to work, sport compared to an unsupervised home exercise program. Do keep in mind, there is contradictory evidence existing for this. So some studies show that supervised physical therapy is better. Some studies show there's no difference between supervised physical therapy versus home exercise program, right? So the BGSM recommendation for exercise is that exercise therapy should be commenced after lateral ankle sprain to optimize recovery of joint functionality. Whether exercise therapy should be supervised or not remains unclear due to contradictory evidence and requires further research. The next logical question becomes, what kind of exercise should I be doing after a lateral ankle sprain? So this is a question that tried to be answered by Wagemans at all in 2022, and they were looking at what's the best, most optimal program for lateral ankle sprain? What exercise should I use? How much? How long should I be doing this for? How do I progress over the, the course of time? And what they found is that consensus regarding optimal training volume and the effect of training volume on recurrent ankle sprains is still lacking in the current literature. So essentially, we don't know what the best dosage of exercise is. We don't know how long folks should be doing physical therapy for. We don't know which exercises are going to be the best in which volumes, how much in terms of sets, reps, frequency, when do we advance? A lot of that's a big question mark at this point, okay? In this study specifically, they tried to evaluate session length, frequency, and duration to see if it affected outcome. There was a small, insignificant trend towards higher volume being better. That does make sense to me. If you have a really poor uh, program that's not comprehensive whatsoever, it's probably not going to do as well as a more robust program, but we don't really know how robust it needs to be and what that minimum effective dosage is, right? <clears throat> So future research should examine which variables such as duration, exercise, content, intensity, have the greatest moderating effect on rehab outcomes, right? Because it may be that uh, these ankles need more balance. Maybe they need more strength. Maybe they need more mobility. We're not really sure yet. Is manual mobilization or manual therapy helpful for lateral ankle sprains? Largely, manual therapies provide a short-term increase in ankle joint dorsiflexion range of motion from 12 randomized controlled trials. So we're pretty certain that doing manual therapies after a lateral ankle sprain is going to improve range of motion and joint mobilization has been reported to help decrease pain. So if we can reduce pain a little bit, restore range of motion, that may be beneficial to our patients. So Cleland et al had a pretty cool study and they were looking at exercise therapy combined with manual therapies. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes. You can check out the exact exercises or excuse me, exact manual therapies they use in this study. If you're interested and actually found better outcomes compared with exercise therapy alone. So largely they had two groups, one group performed just exercise group. Number two performed exercise alongside manual therapy, and they had a better long-term outcome in the manual therapy plus exercise subgroup. 
So our BGSM recommendation for manual therapy in combination with other treatment modalities, such as exercise therapy, enhances the efficacy of manual joint mobilization and is therefore advised. So make sure you're doing your exercise, but if you add some manual therapies to it, it may enhance your short and long-term outcomes. Should surgery be considered a treatment for lateral ankle sprain injuries? So what type of surgery would you get for a lateral ankle sprain? So in a lateral ankle sprain, you can either very much stretch out the ligaments on the side of the ankle, or you potentially rupture those. So surgery would be a reconstruction of those ligaments. Usually they cut the ligaments, they shorten them a little bit, and then they reattach them. Okay. The most common procedure is called a brostrum or modified brostrum procedure. And they do the same thing. So they reconstruct those lateral ligaments, make them a little bit more tight. When they perform this surgery, it could be on the ATFL or the CFL, or maybe both. So these surgical procedures are actually very common until we start to figure out that a conservative approach can often be equally as effective as surgery, right? So eventually we stop doing as many surgeries over the course of time for that reason. So of course, not all patients are going to require surgery. And in fact, 60 to 70% of all individuals respond well to non-surgical treatments. Therefore, we reserve surgery for patients who have chronic instability after a lateral ankle sprain that have not responded well to a well-rounded physical therapy program. Long-term outcomes of surgery seem to be similar to functional treatment. However, surgery seems to be superior at decreasing recurrent lateral ankle sprains. And if you have a lot of recurrent lateral ankle sprains, that could lead to some more osteoarthritis over the course of time. So the argument kind of becomes, should I just do the surgery to reduce the likelihood of recurrences? Because that may end up, you know, giving me some long-term arthritis, right? So that would be that kind of argument. There is limited evidence in patients who receive surgical treatment that they have a longer recovery time, they have a higher incidence of ankle stiffness, they have impaired ankle mobility, and they can potential have, potentially have surgical complications. Now, I've treated my fair share of post-op ankles, and I think largely they tend to get pretty dang stiff after folks have surgery. Obviously, you want some of that stiffness. That stiffness is good because Previously, the ankle was too loose, but I would agree with this, with, excuse me, with this literature as well. I tend to see a lot of folks have stiff ankles and it's really tough to get that range of motion back after surgery. More recent research, and again, I'm going to leave these links in the show notes, have shown that recovery of ankle activity and instability are significantly better with surgical treatment versus exercise treatment. So if someone has a prostrum technique, Maybe they have a really nice, strong, stiff ankle, less likely to feel unstable. However, it might feel a little bit stiffer. Our BGSM recommendation is despite good clinical outcomes of surgery after both chronic injuries and acute complete lateral ligament ruptures, functional treatment is still the preferred method as not all patients require surgical treatment. This also helps to avoid unnecessary exposures to invasive or over-treatment and unnecessary risk of complications. However, treatment decisions have been made based on the individual, with the doctor, with the patient, with the physical therapist. Everyone should come together with a shared decision-making process and figure out what's best for that individual. Does ultrasound, laser, or electrotherapy have a place in the treatment of lateral ankle sprains? So these three treatments have shown no effect on pain or edema, no effect on function, and no difference with return to play. Seems like these are not the best evidence-based treatments for lateral ankle sprains at this point. Return to work and return to sport after lateral ankle sprains. The average time to return to sport after lateral ankle sprains is 16 to 24 days. And up to 40% of these injuries become chronic ankle instability or some sort of recurrent injury. In NCAA athletes, 44.4% return to play in less than 24 hours and 3.6% required more than 21 days after returning to play, including those who did not return to play at all. So the large majority of folks, again, they get better within about two weeks or so. Okay. So this is not an injury that tends to stick around, at least pain-wise, for a long period of time. There's pretty rapid resolution symptoms, and folks get back to sport and activity pretty dang quickly. Again, the problem ends up being that lateral ankle sprains are one of the most common injuries sustained during sport, but they're often perceived to be minor injuries that heal expediently with minimal need for therapeutic intervention. More than half of individuals who sustain a lateral ankle sprain injury do not seek formal medical treatment. There is currently no criteria-based guidelines to inform return to sport decisions following acute lateral ankle sprain injury. 
So a lot of these folks tend to get better pretty quickly, get back to sport very quickly. However, they have longer term issues. So if we have some sort of return to sport criteria, maybe that'll help us to reduce the incidence of recurrences and or chronic ankle instability you know, in the future. And a premature return to sport, so folks getting back too quickly, may be one factor that contributes to the high prevalence of recurrent ankle problems. We did reference literature earlier that if folks are returning to a high work volume, right, so largely if you sprain your ankle and now you're doing a whole lot of sport afterwards, that may increase your chance of having recurrences and or chronic ankle instability. So it makes sense. We should probably make sure we do a really good job rehabbing these folks prior to returning back to sport. And again, Despite being the most commonly incurred sports injury with a high recurrence rate, there are no guidelines to reform or turn to sport decisions following acute lateral ankle sprain injuries. More than half of individuals who sustain a lateral ankle sprain injury do not seek formal medical treatment. Many return to sport before injury-associated impairments are resolved. In fact, 71 to 75% of U.S. high school athletes were sanctioned to return to sport within three days of incurring a lateral ankle sprain, with 95% sanctioned to return to sport within 10 days of injury. So the large majority of athletes are getting back in less than two weeks after a lateral ankle sprain injury. So when we're looking to return back to sport or work, we know that a supervised exercise program like physical therapy focused on a combination of proprioception and balance strength, coordination, and functional drills or return to sport drills is going to lead to a faster return to sport. So if folks do some physical therapy, they get back to sport faster. Okay. And this stat is also amazing to me, but when exposing athletes with recurrent sprains to proprioceptive training to improve joint position sense, the risk of recurrence of lateral ankle sprains is reduced the same level as healthy controls. Okay. Now what that means so if I have an athlete that gets a lateral ankle sprain and I do a good job with the rehab, now the risk of injury is right back to where it was prior to the injury, okay? But if I don't do that solid rehab program, then they have a 50% chance of having recurrences, chronic ankle instability, and potentially osteoarthritis over the course of time. It seems like a no-brainer to me that every single person that gets a lateral ankle sprain should probably be placed on some sort of rehab program to help them out. So a major problem that we have is that we know that some sort of exercise-based program after having a sprain injury is going to be important, okay? We just don't know how much we need and when athletes are going to be ready to return back to sport, okay? So BGSM 2021, they attempted to put together a return to sport criteria after lateral ankle sprain. This is from Smith et al., BGSM 2021. I'll put a link in the show notes if you guys want to actually read this article. So they developed a consensus statement using Delphi survey process. What is the Delphi survey process? It's a technique that's well-established to answer a research question through the identification of a consensus view across subject experts. So largely 198 people completed a series of surveys, right? I think initially they sent out 250 I ended up getting 198 responses and they sent it out to people they felt were most relevant or the best experts to answer these questions. So it was three round surveys were included and they basically included the items with greater than 70% agreement. So if there was a large discrepancy between experts on a certain topic, let's say range of motion after ankle sprain, then they weren't including that in the consensus statement. The folks that were involved were health professionals. So physical therapists, athletic trainers or therapists and sports medicine physicians. They also included athletes competing in nationally selected representative teams. They chose those working in field or court sports where acute lateral ankle sprain injuries are among the most prevalent. They also used those involved in making return to sport decisions for athletes with an acute lateral ankle sprain injury. So they did a pretty good job of selecting folks that were considered experts in the field of lateral ankle sprains. And they utilize a series of three surveys sent out to these folks to try to figure out some sort of consensus in the way that we start treating these folks and then returning them back to sport after lateral ankle sprain. So they created this PASS criteria or framework. So PASS, P-A-A-S-S, the P stands for pain severity. This is both during sports participation and over the last 24 hours. Keep in mind, pain tends to resolve very quickly in lateral ankle sprains, so they didn't want to include pain over the, pa- the prior week. They chose to include pain in the past 24 hours since these things tend to get better very quickly. They're looking at ankle impairments, so basically ankle range of motion, 
ankle muscle strength, endurance, and power. They believe this was important for return to sport. They're looking at athlete perception. So perceived ankle confidence or reassurance. They're looking at perceived ankle stability. Do the athletes feel like their ankle has regained stability over the course of time? And also psychological readiness. Do the athletes feel like they're ready to return to sport? The S was sensor and motor control. So is their proper proprioception returned? Do they now have better dynamic postural control or balance? And the last S stands for sport slash functional performance. So hopping and jumping test, agility test, sport specific activities, and ability to complete a full training session. So P A A S S pass. So essentially if they pass these tests, they're uh, ready to return to sport. So this consensus statement is just a framework. They did not nominate specific tests or outcome measures for these variables. It does not specify how clinicians should assess these items. So if we're looking at athlete uh, perception and psychological readiness, maybe use an outcome measure for psychological readiness to return to sport. However, they didn't say to use that specific outcome, right? There's no data on cutoff points for measures that indicate an athlete should or should not return to sport. So largely, they weren't looking at research showing that if your ankle range of motion is not full, right, then you shouldn't return back to sport because you're more likely to get hurt compared to someone who regains their full range of motion. The evidence doesn't exist. We're just trying to come up with some sort of framework to help our athletes out. And this is our best guess so far how to evaluate these athletes to figure out if they're ready to return to sport. So I've taken the past framework and I've come up with some ideas that you can use for your patients, right? So again, just keep in mind, I kind of came up with these based on my own assumptions of this framework or criteria. This framework or criteria is not perfect, but I think if you go through this a bit, it'll help you out figuring out which athletes are ready to return back to sport. We're not just throwing athletes back kind of willy nilly, right? <clears throat> So for pain severity, you can pretty easily use a VAS scale. So zero to 10 scale of people's pain. I would recommend people have minimal to no pain before you return back to sport. In terms of ankle impairments, we can look at strength of the plantar flexors, dorsal flexors, inverters, everters. And I would say you probably want 90% plus on isometric testing before returning athletes back. From an endurance perspective, we can look at calf raises or toe raises to failure. How is the endurance looking like of the calf musculature, the tibialis anterior musculature? In terms of range of motion, we probably want to be within normal limits or around 90% symmetry between sides. Do keep in mind that a lot of these folks end up with longer term issues with range of motion. Sometimes you'll see folks have too much inversion, but they don't have enough dorsiflexion. I think this is largely just related to the way these things heal over the course of time. So having 100% range of motion between sides might not be reasonable for all athletes. From a power perspective, we could be looking at, let's say, single-legged pogo jumps, your ability to maintain a specific metronome for a period of time. We could also test hopping on a force plate left to right to see what is that rate of force development. Are we gaining symmetry between sides? From an athlete perception perspective, we can use outcome measures like a psychological readiness questionnaire. So largely, do your athletes feel like they're ready to return back to sport after having a lateral ankle sprain injury? We can measure sensor and motor control via either a star excursion balance test or Y balance test. We can also look at balance with eyes closed. There's a variety of tests that might be worthwhile checking out with your patients. From a sport or functional performance perspective, we can look at hop testing, both vertically or horizontally. We can also look at some jumping in the frontal or transverse plane. We know that, let's say, a lateral ankle sprain has uh, trouble handling forces in the frontal plane. So maybe that's a little bit more relevant for those athletes. We can look at agility drills that are sport specific, maybe something like a T drill, pro agility drill, something along those, along those lines to see if people are getting ready to return back to sport. I think the other piece that's probably going to be important is the ability to complete a full training session. So not just to get through it, but to get through it with minimal to no pain and then minimal to no swelling, reduced range of motion or excessive soreness following practice. So what are our timelines to return to sport after someone has a lateral ankle sprain injury? So we already know the large majority of folks are getting back within the first couple of days. Okay. Now it's just that those folks are getting back might not actually be ready. Okay. And that's the problem. And the other part is that there's a wild difference between re return to sport time between individuals. And that's going to depend on a lot of different factors. So largely, what was the grade of the injury? 
what is the sport or activity the athlete wants to get back to getting back to, let's say rowing or weightlifting is probably going to come a lot faster than returning back to basketball. It's probably going to depend on the individual. How old is that individual? So if you smoke or you're advanced in age, maybe it takes a little bit longer for you to heal and recover compared to a teenager. And as I said previously, I think the larger question is, are we actually ready to return to sport? If your pain levels are down and you feel as though you can return back to sport, does that mean you're actually ready to return to sport? So we probably want to try to use some sort of past framework, some sort of return to sport criteria that we can utilize to figure out if folks are truly ready to get back to sport. The next important thing that I think as physical therapists, we should start to think about a little bit is going to be tissue healing times. So after you have an injury, there are three distinct phases of healing. We have an inflammatory stage. We have the proliferative phase. And we have the remodeling phase. Largely inflammatory stage starts right after the injury. And then you move into proliferative phase and then you go into the remodeling phase. So the remodeling phase is going to begin around week two after someone has an injury. Now, these stages are very different based on the ligament. So if you have a ligament inside a joint, that's going to take a little bit longer. So these numbers are probably going to vary quite a bit based on the ligament. But if you have the remodeling phase, which is going to start, let's say, around two weeks and extend on for years after someone has an injury, starting at week two, however, majority of your athletes are getting back within 10 days, are you actually healed in that ligament? before you're returning back to sport, I think undoubtedly, no, we're probably not fully recovered in that ligament before we're sending our athletes back. I just think when people sprain their ankles, it's interesting because if you have an injury to, let's say your ACL or your MCL or your LCL, or maybe in your elbow at the UCL, right? Or maybe you have a bank artery, you have a shoulder dislocation, something along those lines. It's very, very common for physicians to try to shut down these athletes for somewhere between six and 12 weeks, right? That's standard advice. If you sprain your UCL, hey, let's give it six weeks, stop throwing. And after six weeks, we can slowly start to ramp up your throwing over the course of time, right? If you tear your ATFL, 50% of folks are getting back within 24 hours. That's crazy. And I think the whole idea of feels good versus ready to play are entirely different things. We know if you return your athlete back quickly without doing some sort of rehab program, you're predisposing themselves to a poor outcome, potentially recurrence, instability, maybe some longer term osteoarthritis. So I think at the end of the day, as physical therapists, it's probably important for us to start thinking about these injuries as maybe something that's a little bit more important and maybe not sending our athletes back within the first couple of days after lateral ankle sprain, taking these a little bit more seriously so our folks have a better long-term outcome. And it's not just, okay, you sprain your ankle, no big deal, rub some dirt on it and get back out there, right? It's probably not a great way to do it. So what are my opinions on timelines for returning to sport? So A, I think we should probably be waiting a little bit longer to return to sport in the large majority of athletes, okay? You have to keep in mind, so the ligaments in your ankles, largely they're not intra-articular, so maybe they have faster healing times than let's say an MCL injury or another injury to another ligament that heals a bit slower. I believe that four to six weeks should be a little bit more standard. So if you look at the duration of the physical therapy programs, I'll, again, I'll leave a link in the show notes for the references. These folks were doing somewhere between four, or eight weeks of physical therapy, right? So we probably need to be doing physical therapy for a longer period of time before athletes get back. The other piece is that the amount of time it takes folks to get back to sport after a lateral ankle sprain is going to be very, very variable, obviously depending on the grade and other factors. So we probably need some sort of return to sport criteria to figure out when folks get back. Okay. If someone has regained all their strength, all the range of motion, the proprioception, they feel super ready to return back to sport. Maybe we can get them back at week two, right? But the same person that had a lateral ankle sprain at week two that has no strength, poor range of motion, still hurts, can't get through practice, we probably have to delay them a little bit longer, all right? We need some sort of system that we can figure out which, uh, which athletes get back sooner, which athletes are going to take a little bit longer, and currently we don't do that. And lastly, we should probably base a return to sport times uh, on the activity 
that the person is trying to get back to or the sport the person is trying to get back to. So if I'm trying to get back to, let's say, Olympic weightlifting, right? I actually worked with a lot of CrossFitters that sprain their ankles because they fall down on a rope climb and land on the rope. Or they're doing pull-ups and they kind of come down on a plate and they roll their ankle, okay? Those individuals, as long as they're being safe, can probably get back to CrossFit a lot faster because they're usually not doing any cutting in their program, right? Or much jumping. If you compare that to a basketball player, they have to run, jump, cut, change direction, all these things just to play their sport. So they're probably going to take a little bit longer to return back. The position is also going to be important. If you look at the demands of, let's say, a football quarterback versus a wide receiver, excuse me, wide receiver, a wide receiver has a larger demand on that ankle. They may take a little bit longer to get back compared to your quarterback. How about future injury prevention? Is there a way that we can help to reduce lateral ankle sprain recurrences after we've already had a primary lateral ankle sprain? And the answer is yes. But what forms of treatment are actually effective for reducing injuries? In terms of footwear and shoes, there is no evident conclusions that exist on the role of footwear in the prevention of ankle sprain injuries. A lot of this research was looking at low tops versus high tops. doesn't seem that footwear is going to influence your rate of re-injury over the course of time. How about bracing or taping? Well, it looks like bracing and taping actually reduces the risk of both recurrences as well as first-time ankle sprains. And this is especially true in folks in sports. So it might be worthwhile for basketball players to wear something like an ASO after they've had a primary injury. And it might actually be worthwhile to wear that before folks have gotten hurt. Okay. So it seems like wearing those things helps reduce the rate of injury in folks that even haven't had an ankle sprain injury quite yet. So the recommendation coming from the British Journal of Sports Medicine is that both tape and brace have a role in the prevention of recurrent lateral ankle sprains, despite limited evidence on mechanisms that lead to these beneficial effects. The choice of usage should depend on personal preferences, although keep in mind, it does seem a bit like the functional braces perform a little bit better than tape. Is exercise helpful to reduce future injuries? Yes. Coordination and balance training have been shown to prevent recurrent ankle sprains. The effect size is even larger in athletes. So if, you're, <clears throat> so if you have an ankle sprain and you're trying to return back to sport, if you perform a rehab program, that's going to reduce the likelihood of having a future injury. So when exposing athletes with recurrent sprains to proprioceptive training, the risk of recurrence is reduced to the same level as healthy controls. I know that's the third time that I've quoted this, but I think that statement is so powerful. If you have an athlete that sprains her ankle, if you do a good job from a rehab perspective, you reset their risk back to that before they actually have the injury. And that's very, very powerful. A large majority of folks, so around 50%, are going to have chronic issues moving forward. We can reduce a lot of that, and I think we should. So our BJSM recommendation is that it is advised to start exercise therapy, especially in athletes, as soon as possible after the initial sprain to prevent recurrent lateral ankle sprain injuries. Exercise therapy should be included into regular training activities as much as possible as home-based exercise. So do your exercise after lateral ankle sprains. If you guys are enjoying this evidence-based guide, I have another one for you. It is the evidence-based guide to patellofemoral pain syndrome. So I'm going to leave a link in the show notes. And I'm also going to leave a link up in the corner. So go ahead and click on that link if you want to continue with the learning. If you guys are interested in the references, I do recommend you check those out. I will leave them as a link in the show notes and you can get to reading them. Lastly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're on YouTube, smash that thumbs up button, leave a comment. I love to hear your thoughts on this presentation and consider subscribing. It helps me out a ton. If you are listening to the podcast version of this, please consider leaving a positive rating and review. It helps me out tremendously. And lastly, if you want to go that last extra step in supporting me, please consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. All you have to do is head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders Online Library, just $1 for a week-long trial, and you get more great learning from me. I'll leave a link in the note show notes as well, so you can check that out pretty easily. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one.